Hey everybody, it's uh, Tuesday, March 31st, 2020, and I want to talk about where we are, what our government's been doing, and I want to talk about how that's not really the right question for me to keep asking. Um, so Sunday night, we had a press conference where uh, the president abandoned the Easter go back to work strategy, and that I came away from that feeling like, okay, our government is doing nothing. And I, I, I didn't like that. I didn't like the way that that felt. So I was talking about getting into the herd immunity strategy and, you know, what can we do rather than just sit here and wait and let this thing run its course? Uh, can't we do something? Well, uh, apparently I'm not the only one who felt that way because the press conference on Monday night was all about showing us what's being done and everything that's being done is in the medical uh, treatment uh, diagnosis testing uh, supporting the medical staff there's a lot that's being done it's not all government okay it's a lot a lot of it is really in the private sector but the government has a role and is coordinating that so um, let's see what do we have? Oh, so some of the things, some of the things that they talked about. We have factories like the My Pillow factory producing tens of thousands of masks. I don't know that they're shipping yet, but you know they're they're gearing up to deliver tens of thousands of masks. We have manufacturers like uh, auto companies in hard manufacturing that are producing uh, ventilators. They're tooling up. It's going to be a little while. You know, you can't just go from cars to ventilators, but but they're doing that. Uh, we have the FDA approved chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, you know, in, in the respect that, you know, that, uh, that facilitates the use of it and testing good. It wasn't prohibited before, as I mentioned, but, you know, the FDA did step up and do that. The, uh, we have more options for testing, and the one that was highlighted most was Abbott Laboratories' five-minute test. And I want to talk a lot about that. I, I've dug into it and learned more. That'll be on a different video. And then there's companies doing sterilization of the, um, you know, N95 masks for the healthcare workers. So there's a, a lot going on, and, uh, you know, there's, there's something else that I learned. I'll talk more about this. I'll do another video in the detail of the FDA. But uh, something came out. It wasn't mentioned in the press conference, but in looking at some of these manufacturers and what they're doing, uh, I found out that there really is a the FDA has a fast track method, if you will, to address uh, emergencies within the country. So that's really good news because we keep hearing about antivirals and vaccines with the FDA process and now there is you still have to test it but uh, well, well there is it, it's it makes me feel good to know that there's a mechanism in place to uh, minimize the bureaucratic delay the bure bureaucracy that doesn't really add any value at the far end um, but okay I will make other videos to talk about that stuff but I want to talk about right now I've, I've, I've on Monday in my video, I kind of did a shift, as I said, towards the herd immunity strategy. And I think I'm, you know, starting to understand why we're not doing that and why that's not a good thing. Uh, first of all, the president. Uh, pay attention when he talks about the 1.1 million people dead. Okay. You know, yeah, Trump's full of hyperbole. You know, we, we all know that. But watch his, watch his reaction. Watch his look. He's serious about that, okay? He, and, you know, the criticism on, against Trump has been he doesn't listen to the scientists. He's, you know, he's gone rogue or, or you know, he's, you know, maybe there, there's even a claim that he's circumventing the FDA. None of that's happening. Um, you know, if anything, his reversal and his, you know, repeated statement to this one million plus Americans dead is him listening to the scientists. Um, so that's a model. We hear a lot about the models, the, the, the scientific models that we're running and what is a model. So 
my background is in engineering, and a, a model is a simulation. So you have a, a computer simulation, and in engineering, they're uh, extremely useful because in in engineering, you may be building something that's never been built before, but you're using materials and you're using components that we know a lot about. They exist. They're uh, you know. We have specifications for them. We understand how they behave under different conditions and situations. So in, in other areas of science, we have predictive models. And uh, these are a little bit different. Same idea. You have a computer. You, you enter mathematic equations into a computer. You try to come up with, as best you can, all the different variables that are going to come into play, and you have to weight those variables. Um, and so you enter all this in. You create a, an algorithm, uh, you know, a computer program, and then you input the data that you have, and it gives you the results. So in this case, we want to know about the spread of the disease, the infection level of the disease. And, you know, when you input that stuff, you know, what Trump says, 1.1 million or 1.3 million, whatever number he's citing, that's what the models that are science experts, CDC, you know, whatever, that's what they're using. So the models that they're using are telling them that over a million Americans will die if we do nothing. So that's a big risk. I mean, that's a huge risk. Now, you may have heard a, that a, uh, there was some misreporting about the models used in the United Kingdom. So the United Kingdom initially went for a herd immunity strategy. So they targeted isolation. So the whole idea, we keep saying, it's important to, to keep this in mind. The whole issue here is to prevent our hospitals from being overrun. That's the problem we're trying to solve. We, we don't want to have critically ill Americans by the hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands that need critical care and they can't get it. So they're just left to die on their own. Uh, that is not a pretty picture. That's not we, what we ever want to see. So that's what we're trying to stop. But so it's reasonable. And the United Kingdom took this to say, OK, there's only a segment of the population that is likely to end up needing that critical care. So we're going to isolate them. Uh, we'll we'll, we'll do, take measures to protect them, and then we'll let the rest of the population go. So the, the disease can run its course through the, the low-risk population while we protect the high-risk, and the end result being that, um, you know, the hospitals don't get under overrun. That's the idea. So, uh, the model, so the UK embraced this strategy. The, they received a lot of negative, you know, uh, the scientific community, I understand, worldwide just said, no, no, you don't want to do this. You don't want to do it. You know, it's going to be bad. So a scientist, Neil Fer or Professor Neil Ferguson at the uh, Imperial College of London did a model. And he ran the model, and the result told him 500,000 people would need critical medical care, uh, which overwhelms their health care system. So the UK government, between the pressure and the new model, they said, all right, we're out, we're done, we're not doing it, we're going to stay in place. He ran another model, and the, the news came out that he uh, updated his model, and now the new result was 20,000 dead. So there's a misunderstanding, and some were misreporting what that meant. When he updated the model, he inputted the new information. So the data, the information based on isolating, uh, well, stay at home, having to stay at home and closing all but, you know, the grocery stores and whatnot, then put that in and the end result was 20,000. So the updated model was more the new input, same calculation, same algorithm, uh, different input showed the result to be 20,000. In the, in the hospitals, which is more manageable, and uh, you know, it depends on periods of time. The misreporting said when he said updated the model, they were assuming that the algorithm, the calculation, was found to be an error, and they updated it. So therefore, the twenty thousand really represented what it would have been had they done the hurt. And that, that's just that's just a misunderstanding. The updated model was just an updated report, an updated result based on the new input going in, not difference coming out. So uh, 
Okay, so we have model. Now, it, it's okay. It's right thinking to question the accuracy of the model because predictive models of complex systems, it's still human beings trying to do their best to say, we know all the variables, we know the weighting of all the variables, but in real reality, with these predictive models, they are updated. The algorithms and things are changed along the way as you observe reality and you observe your model. So if you do a model that projects out a period of time, say 10 years, or in this case, a number of people infected as the infections increase, okay, so you can update your model. As you move forward, you look at how your model's tracking what's really happening. And if your model seems to be going off course, then you investigate, try to figure out why, and you correct it. So, yes, it's, it's valid to say you can't pretend that models are 100% are accurate, but we got to look at orders of magnitude. It's the best thing that we have. It's the best calculation, the best estimation we have of what would happen. So in the case of the UK, 500,000. Well, would it be 490? Would it be 300? You know, it's still a big number. And then by doing this other scenario, it drops to 20,000. Okay, we have a big orders of magnitude different. Nobody's banking on that 20,000 number. Nobody is, you know, nobody's saying that's precise. If you listen to Fauci say, he'll say things that sound precise, he'll throw out numbers like 100,000 or 200,000. And, and then when the reporters ask him, he's always backing it out. He always seems to be saying, well, you know, we're not sure. And that's because these aren't exact precise measurements, okay? But, uh, so anyway, the models we have a million dead, well, maybe it's only 500,000, you know, maybe it's a million four. I, you know, it's a big problem, okay? And then when you, you do the separation, the numbers come way, way, way down, like, you know, factors of 10 and 20. So that's what's driving the decision. So, uh, you know, I started thinking about the models, and my, personally, I've been kind of hung up on this R, R naught number. Um, the R naught is a little R with a zero, and that is a, a number they assign to an infectious disease to indicate how fast it spreads. So in the, in the curves, when you're going up, your R naught is greater than one. When you're coming down, your R naught is less than one. And it's, again, it's not a perfect exact measurement, but it's approximating that above one. And so if it's a two, that's saying every, for every infected person, there's gonna be two more. And then each of those two are gonna affect two more. So if it's three, if it's four, you know, it goes up, you know, exponentially. So I keep seeing the range. I wanna know what is that, okay? Because, uh, you know, my background is engineering. I want precise numbers. I wanna know what, so I was wrongly assuming that they study the virus itself and then they assign a number to it. So as if you were to look at any other sort of electronic component or a, a mechanical material and you assign specifications to it and then that material will, should always perform to those specifications. And that's how I was kind of looking looking at an R naught for a virus. I don't think that's what it is. Okay? I'm not an expert in infectious diseases. It's not my subject matter, okay? But we all do research. We all try to understand this stuff. So um, I see a range, okay? And then I saw a range that the previous SARS outbreak had a higher, I mean, it had a window of range, but it was actually a higher R naught than this disease. So I'm like, well, you know, why didn't we do all this shutdown for the previous SARS epidemic if it had, a, if anything, a higher R naught number? I think what I've, what I've concluded is R naught is not derived by analyzing the disease, the virus itself. It's just an observation of what you're currently seeing out in the public. Okay? So, and the, uh, measures, the extreme measures that we're taking and all the concern and the high hospitalization and high death numbers are not coming from a precise R0. I think it's coming more from the health effects of the disease, how the disease affects the body. And uh, so R0 is just a way that we're currently, as we see it spreading numbers, as the numbers go up, we then derive the R0 from what's happening. So it's really a number to assign to what we're seeing as opposed to assigning it to the 
to the disease. So what is it about this virus that makes it so terrible? I think the main thing is this, what I've been calling dormancy. Maybe it's the wrong word, but uh, in other words, once you're infected, you're contagious, okay, right away early on, but you may go a week. You may go up to 14 days before you see the first symptom. So all throughout 14 days, and that's a long period of time when you're going to work and you're traveling and you're eating in restaurants and bars or uh, movie theaters, you're spreading this virus, okay? So that's the theory. Now, it, you know, maybe the r not is 30. You know, maybe it's like a measles type thing, but we wouldn't know that until it was too late because the r not comes from what's happening, okay? It's not really a predictive thing. Um, so yeah, in a way it is, but anyway, so... Uh, the the health of that's the biggest problem with this disease. So recalibrate your thinking a little bit. So people that say, well, it's just the flu. Look at the numbers. I mean, only 20% are really going to need to go to the hospital. Only the well, the flip side of that is that that's the reason it's such a it's such a harmful disease. That's the reason we're so worried about it spreading throughout the entire population. It's because 80% of the people aren't going to really be that sick. So they would just go out. And you know, early on I wondered. Okay, so I had, we all heard that this thing was uh, didn't show symptoms right away, but you know, China, we saw videos from China and, and airlines and cruise ships, they're measuring people's temperature. Well, you know, if you're like me, you looked at that and said, well, yeah, that's all well and good, but I thought I heard they could be infected for, you know, 7 to 14 days before they show any symptoms, and a lot of people won't show any symptoms. It will be very mild. They may not develop a temperature. Maybe it's the cough. Maybe it's something else. So that's true. So that measuring their body temperature didn't do you a whole heck of a lot. You were only actually catching a very small percentage of the people that have the disease. So I believe that's what all the extreme precautions are over this disease. That's where the model and the predictions are that the hospitals will get overrun. It's not because of the R0, and it's not necessarily because of the percentage of death and sickness and everything compared to the flu. It's just... It spreads so quickly, it's spreading and we don't know it, okay? So, you know, that's what it's all about. That's the alarmism. Um, that's the, you know, that's why the herd immunity strategy is being avoided. Um, so the question then becomes, what are we doing? I'm not a fan of sit and wait. Let's just sit and wait. Uh, well, I, we, we're doing a lot of things in the area of treating, treatment, testing, um, you know, and, and, you know, this, this five-minute portable test of habits is, is really big. Um, I mean, you could actually envision employers, uh, you know, at some point testing everybody as you come to work. So you would know. And once you know, you just isolate yourself. So, um, you know, that's where we are. Um, I, I feel a lot better about what we're doing as a country. And I will talk more about this, but I, I missed something, okay? And I missed... Uh, maybe because of the news. If you watch the news, most of the reporting, the people that report this stuff, they are political reporters. They, that's all they know. Okay, so all they know are, you know, president and head of the CDC, and they question people's judgment, this and that. And if you've watched some of my other videos, I can I try to analyze what's happening from the standpoint of world world real world problem solving and business and things. And you know, guess what? Nobody in our media does that. They just don't do that. So we sit here thinking that all of our answers lie in government, and they don't. Okay, government has a role. Now, uh, South Korea, I understand that their biotech industry, their private business, played a big role in their testing and their success. But uh, in China, yeah, sure, China has embraced some capitalism, but it's still all about the government. Whenever they're making all the decisions, they're, they're clamping things down, they still exercise uh, author authoritarian control. So, you know, you really are not comparing apples to apples 
you know, the, set aside human rights and freedom just for a second, you're not even comparing apples to apples if you take what the Chinese government can do and compare what our government's doing. Because what you really need to compare is what our whole country is doing, our private industry and our government against what China's government was doing. Um, so, I mean, if this were a board game, right? If we were playing a video game about viruses spreading, you just lock it down, right? I mean, you lock it down, you stop it from spreading, and boom, you win the game. Um, we're not non-player characters in a game. We're not, you know, little tokens on a board. We're people. We're human beings. And our whole system of government, our whole, you know, culture is based on the value of that, the value of each individual person and, and their freedom. So, you know, as tempting as it might be to say, put all these tight controls in, and, and guess what? A, a herd immunity strategy would be a tight control. Um, that's not who we are. And, you know, I don't think that's who we want to be. I don't want to be totally dependent on the government. And uh, so, you know, um, but again, I will go through and show you what I've learned about some of the more detail of what's going on with the private industry and the role of the FDA and whatnot, and I'll, I'll be doing a couple of videos today, so look for it. So hang in there, be blessed. I hope this is helping you. Talk to you soon.